Three years ago, this animal was discovered, Tiktaalik. It was being sought intentionally in sediments of 380 million years of age in northern Canada, in the Inuit territory, because these other two animals were known. This starts to show, show some signs of being an amphibian, but this is still, for, by and large, a fish. This is clearly an amphibian. And as I said, three years ago, Tiktaalik was discovered, clearly intermediate. But what concerned mostly the contemporaries of Darwin and other people who asked the question, where are the intermediates? Are the intermediates between the common ancestor of our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, and humans? By the time Darwin died, none of these intermediates was known. Seven years later, in 1889, the first one was discovered, something now called a creature now known as Homo erectus. It was discovered by a Dutch physician uh, in Java, in what is today Java, and he called it Pithecanthropus erectus. Pite and Anthropos monohuman erectus had a small brain, but clearly this physician who knew anatomy was aware that this individual had to have walk in on, on two legs, that is, that had a, an erect gait. Since then, thousands of intermediates of these hominids, which are the intermediates between our, non uh, the, our ape ancestors and modern humans, thousands of these have been discovered. Literally, dozens of them are new ones are discovered every year. An important one that I am going to use to illustrate a principle is Australopithecus uh, afarensis, Lucy. The point that I want to make is, according to the theory of natural selection, evolution will, be, will not be something that happens gradually in all respects. This is the way his contemporaries thought evolution happened. Darwin said, no, different parts will evolve at different times in response, to the, in response to the needs of the environment. And here you have a classic example. If you look at two of the major features that distinguish us from the apes, one is we have a larger brain three to four times larger than that of a male chimpanzee, and then the bipedal gait. And if we look at Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, here is what was found 40 years ago, 40% of a, the skeleton of an individual. But I want just to look at the hip bone, the pelvis. A good anatomist will have many other ways to find out that Lucy had bipedal gait. But if we look at the pelvis, I have enlarged because Lucy could have been a three feet tall uh, young woman. Uh, I have enlarged in size to compare the shape with that of the mother human and with that of a gorilla. And it's clearly that Lucy could not walk the way a gorilla or a chimp works, uh, walks, knuckle walking, resting on the knuckles because the, the hip bone was not large enough, so he had to walk like that. But the brain will only come, become larger much later, starting about two million years ago. Darwin used also comparative anatomy. And here I'm using a simple example, the bones of a dog, a bird, a whale, and a human. The four limbs are made of the same bones, organized in the same way. And yet they are used for completely different purposes, for swimming, for flying, for running, and for handling objects or for writing. And the argument of Darwin was, uh, how do we explain that similarity? An engineer does not design an airplane and a ship and a car with the same parts organized in the same way, but uses new materials uh, for each purpose. How do we explain this similarity, he says, from a common ancestor? which had already this structure in the foreign limbs, actually from Tiktaalik, although he didn't know about Tiktaalik. Well, the most convincing evidence uh, for evolution uh, comes from a science, scientific discipline that didn't exist in Darwin's time, and not for a century since the origin of a species, molecular biology. Now, we know the genetic information and the evolutionary information is in, in case in the DNA, in the succession of these letters, 
And the human genome has three billion of these letters. They have evolutionary and genetic information. If we were to write all the letters of a human genome, we will need 500 volumes of the size of the Bible. That's how much info genetic information we have. And every little part of that information we can use to reconstruct evolutionary history. By the way, I carry my DNA on my necktie. I don't know if you can see it. This was done copying from a book of mine, <laughs> that model. Um, the first demonstration of this was done in 1967 with a very small molecule, because at the time we still could not handle full genomes, not even large genes as we do now, or large proteins. This is a very small protein, and it was done by two scientists, the leader ones, uh, Professor Walter Fitch, who was at the time a very young scientist, now he's a senior professor in my department at the University of California in Irvine. Uh, but this was in 1967, and this is how molecular evolution uh, works, the st comparative study to find out the relationship between different organisms. Uh, here you have uh, humans, uh, monkeys, and horse, and here you have the sequence of amino acids as they go. So that you align them, and when you align them, you find they are mostly similar, but there is one difference only between humans and monkeys, and 11 of 12 between humans and horses. Yeah, it's getting to be so, time to wrap up. Sorry? Time to wrap up. Okay, I will finish in one minute or two. So here we have uh, the comparison uh, in a simple matrix. Now, they did a comparison between 22 organisms. You have this matrix. You fit this matrix into a computer, given the computer the two basic laws of evolution, and the computer produced this. An evolution which was, goes, covers two billion years, one branch does, goes to the yeast and fungi, another branch goes to insects, another branch to the vertebrates. Amazing, a little molecule. Now we can use thousands of genes to do this, and indeed we have reconstructed the whole evolution of all organisms in the world by these methods. Thank you. Thank you.